Um, Antonia, I read that you have met um, Paulo Freire personally, you know? Yeah. And mm -hmm. is it true you had a sort of clash with him? When, when uh, the white uh, the white man was talking about how to change the world, no, it was that, interesting that, how you met him. Um, well, I, I never thought of Paulo as as a white male because he was a, you know he was Brazilian and and South American and Latin American, so I never thought of him in that way. Um, what I did, what it, no, what happened was that that um, I mean there were there were a number of things, but that. It really had to do with where um, in the United States, because of the way that uh, different um, cultural groups at that time, you know, had to struggle in order for, in order to be acknowledged, in order to, for opportunities. Um, and that often certain, uh, conversations were being had for people rather than with people with or, them, not, yeah. or by the people who were being talked about, you know, in, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, communities of color, for example, there was a, a way in which, in which, you know, people, you know, would stand up and they would, you know, they would speak for us and they, and they were happy to speak for us, you know, because they felt very good because they, that showed how they were anti-racist or whatever. But then when we spoke, <laughs> we didn't speak well enough or we didn't we didn't we didn't quite frame, you know, the political conversation the way uh, that they would frame it, you know, which is was part of the problem. You know, yeah. I, and I would always say that part of the problem was that, you know, they had a lot of experience doing it and they were essentially not permitting us to to develop and mature and grow in our capacity to speak for ourselves. Um, so there was a lot of there was tension and. We had we were in a conference and we just you know said we wanted we 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 wanted uh, a caucus we wanted to caucus the, the 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 participants of color wanted to have some opportunity to meet with with uh, Paulo and Paulo was very you know he was very gracious he was that's one thing about him that um, he was a very loving gracious person even when he didn't agree with things you know <laughs> you know because. There was this sense that that you know you, you can't control people. You, that's not how we we don't come to consciousness through controlling people. We come through consciousness to, through engagement, okay. right? Um, so so he agreed, and so we came, and so we were talking to him, and we were you know talking about our concerns and our our um, our frustrations, and on. He listened very very carefully. And then there was just a moment when um, he, um, you know, he, he, you know, when everyone had had their say and he was very, very clear. And he said, you know, I just don't know <clears throat> of a world where, for example, black people, you know, uh, can be liberated and not, you know, Chicanos, in that yes. case, Chicanos can be liberated. I don't know where Chicanos can be liberated without white working class people being liberated. You know, I mean, he essentially said that the political project was a, a, a project of our humanity, in essence, and that we had to find the way to work across our communities so that the issues within our communities were engaged, but that they were engaged within a context of a larger political struggle uh, for liberation. And it was a very, it was a, for me, it was a very, very important moment because it, you know, it, it, it asked for us to open ourselves a bit and to, um, to think of our own work beyond our own community that our, mm -hmm. that our, that our work, um, had an impact not only on our communities but but of course, you know, yeah. in the largest society and so it was that was a really important moment then there was another time i mean i was just <laughs> i was just like kind of fiery you know really pissed off angry i was frustrated with with the, the things that i had dealt with and if you think i mean i'm coming out of absolute poverty i mean abject poverty i'm you know, I'm a single mother, and I'm 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 
trying to move through it to get an education and I'm trying to work politically and I'm, I'm reaching, you know, constantly dealing with um, obstacles and, yeah. you know, struggles, obstacles and having to find my way around people who, you know, that it, it was their way they would, you know, uh, that very much treated me as if I did not have, you know, the capacity or the <laughs> capability, mm -hmm. which is how racism enacts itself. It's, mm -hmm. it's people who think they know, they know us, or they know, you know, they know subaltern <laughs> students, for example, without really knowing us, you know, and, and, and making assumptions about our intellectual capacity or our capacity to, to participate uh, in the world. So I just would, you know, fight back. I would fight back. Um, and we, I remember one time we were at a, another conference and, you know, he was talking about tolerance, you know, and, you know, that it's important because that, that was Paolo, you know, he had this, I mean, just this capacity to, to tolerate, you know, <laughs> I mean, to, and I, <laughs> To be with that difference without it, you know, uh, totally throwing him off. Although he did have moments of, you know, of depression. I mean, he would feel depressed and frustrated over, you know, the conditions in the world and, and how, you know, the ups and downs mm -hmm. of our political struggles, you know. But in his everyday life, and, it, you know, there was an openness to him. And so I think that his comments really reflected that, you know, that element of tolerance. But I was at a point in my life where I was feeling very tolerant. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you know, and I think I got up and I said, but Paolo, you know, you're, are you asking us to be tolerant about injustice? <laughs> you know? And he just, looked because he knew me, so he just kind of, you know, and he said, you know, you know, the way, you know, the way we speak, I remember, I think, it's, it's, you know, this notion of parsimony of, of, of how we speak, of our talking, you know, that, that we needed to be, that we needed to understand that the way we speak and what we brought to the, the, the table had an impact on the conversations and on the dialogue and they could either but it's really a choice of words uh, this, this a, a choice of words but, but, oh, but more than that right more I than that, it, that yeah. the choice of words are were important right yeah. <laughs> but it was more than that it was it was a sense of coming to it with less bravado i think and a little bit more uh, sobriety in 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 order for us to be able to listen that of course what i believe is that we need it all and i still yeah. believe that i think we need it all you know we need those young people who just you know who, <laughs> who you know who just smash <laughs> yeah. but, i mean that that's the the that's the conversation that we never you know that or seldom have is this understanding that the that's why the intergenerational dimension of politics mm -hmm. is very interesting. You know, it's like if you're, you know, 60 years old, 70 years old, you should have lived enough to mature politically that you could bring that element, which is what Paulo brought. I was in my 30s, you know, so I was still, mm -hmm. you know, and and I don't think we've ever been able to, to um, really think through, you know, the ways that, that elder, elder radical, you know, yeah. folks can support younger people, not be like them. Like you don't have to, you, it, no. it's not asking you to be like a 30 or a 20 year old, you know, or, or, you know, a, a, a 16 year old, you know, it, it, that, that there's something inauthentic about that, but our capacity to understand that we bring, understanding what we bring to the table and understanding that what they bring to the table is absolutely necessary to political mm -hmm. struggle as well. So instead of there being a clash, there's a way in which we begin to think, how do we talk across these intergenerational experiences and how do we use, you know, in, in order, in a, in a positive and cons constructive way is probably the word that I want, a constructive way, the different strengths that we have at different mm -hmm. moments in our, in our development. You know, 
he was able also to em emphasize the, the the common topic. No, I mean, right. to speak about let let's have different points of view, but it's about a common world we want to create. Yeah. Well, and we it, are creating. It, uh, yes, Dirk. That, I mean, that that is that he never lost sight of that. You know that we had that we shared this world. Yeah, you know, we shared with this world, and and that whatever we did it had to we had to find a way yeah. to communicate with each other and um i mean it's it's a difficult one because it may you know it may be that at different points in political struggle there are different strategies mm -hmm. that we have to rather than than getting one dimensional about our political strategies i mean that's what i'm trying we have to you know how do we bring a multi-dimensional understanding of political strategies to the table so that we understand at some sometimes it's an absolute you know closing down you know where you say mm -hmm. you know where where you the demands are absolutely essential in making a point but we can't stay there <laughs> because if we stay there then how do we prepare if we do have opportunities how how do how do we how do we create a different political structure in the world and i had i have um a friend uh and and comrade tom griffith who's actually right now in oslo teaching in oslo at the university there but his wife is cuban and So he spent time in Cuba, but he also spent time in Venezuela. He's actually Australian <laughs> and, uh, you know, socialist, very, very, you know, a sociologist, really uh, thoughtful, thoughtful comrade. And we were talking about how right now what is happening in Cuba, you know, because mm -hmm. his wife Yuri is Cuban, you know, so. Yuri and I were talking, and I mean, there's it's it's a hard moment in Cuba that most people don't know. I mean, you know, are not paying attention to, but there's a lot of you know, there's some there's a lot of tension bubbling up, and there's there is a bit of you know a, a kind of uh, disconnection with the revolution, you know, on um, on the younger people who didn't experience it, who didn't live it, who weren't part of it, but were, you know, were kind of socialized into it. Uh -huh. And now they're, you know, they're, they're kind of rebelling and there's, there's things that are, you know, that are going on that are, and then the, the government trying to contain it. So that anyway, so there's a lot of contradictions and, and, and concerns about, you know, what, what, what's happening. Um, and so we were having this conversation and, I'm sorry, that's my, my clock. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we were having this conversation about, you know, there's a real need for us to do, again, it's, it's kind of the internal work that doesn't, you know, get done, but some need to look at, you know, Venezuela, Cuba, you know, uh, Nicaragua, Vietnam, Nicaragua, you know, Angola. I mean, you know, look at at at, at where a socialist project, you know, was central, a revolutionary socialist project, and and historically what has happened, and to understand kind of the 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 what has gone on in those societies, and you know what has been problematic, what has not, you know, what have we not been prepared for. Mm -hmm. You know, because it was so much a focus on the revolution, you know, on, uh, on the revolutionary struggle to gain control that our preparation, <laughs> the, you know, um, may never, have. Never question what is uh, the situation right, now. Right. It's too much established, the revolution, yeah. and, and there is right. no critical question of what is happening and what is needed. Exactly. And, and that's, is it true that, that in Cuba, I, I had the impression that. Of course, and there are some concerns uh, among the population, mm -hmm. but at the same time, there is a certain respect also for the legacy of the revolution, and it's it's a huge yeah. contradiction. I mean, there are other yeah. political forces yeah. also, no? But yeah. but mainly, it's about uh, this concern of um, establishing a new society, and, and right. yeah. Yeah. And so there, there are tensions. I mean, there are real tensions. And for somebody who's, you know, very committed to the revolution, the, the people are concerned, 
yeah. about what what it'll mean, especially because you know young uh, it, it it's many young people, you know, so they've got a lot of energy and they've got a lot yeah. of force, and and so it it really it takes me again to that intergenerational conversation about you know in in what ways have we not you know really uh, thought about the different stages of our own development, you know, as, yeah. as revolutionaries or as people who are, who embrace, you know, a socialist, a, a clear socialist um, alternative and yeah. what are, you know, what has gone on. And I, and I just think about it in that it's, it is that, that internal critique, you know, that, that, Let's let's look at. I mean, we've had enough time. There's enough time to to consider. You know, how would we understand what's happened in Cuba? What's happened in Nicaragua? You know, what's happened in other parts? Yeah. So we could learn from it, right? From, yeah. You you were mentioning before also this inner process is is uh, necessary on a, on a personal level, right? But also <laughs> on the yes. structures and the systems and the political exactly. level. And, yes. and if we are not used to do it on a personal level, we won't do it in, in the in the exactly. systems. Yeah, I mean, this. that's right, because what happens is the same defensiveness that we use to not look at ourselves, we will use. I mean, we in, it, 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 there is a dialectic in the yeah. way that we deal with the world is very, you know, how we deal with ourselves is reflected out in how we deal with the world. So I. I I guess what I I invite people to think about is a deeper complexity in our understanding of politics. It isn't just about how well we're able to frame, you know, the abstract uh -huh. theoretical um, uh, structures of, of of our thinking about our politics. It's not that you know we could go out there and you have these wonderful people, which is very interesting to, to me because often. Um, there's there has been a bit of a gender difference in how we've engaged questions of politics. So I think women um, have been a bit more drawn to engaging questions of the body, questions uh -huh. of you know relationships um, politically, and um, where the tendency of men it seems to be much more focused out there. Uh, and wanting to, you know, and very much, you know, this kind of uh, hyper intellectual kind of theorizing, which everybody is very enamored with and very seduced because, you know, if you can hyper, yeah, yeah. Into, then, then somehow, you know, oh, they're so intelligent. Then my whole thing is, well, you know, I mean, I enjoy hearing them, but at the end, what, wow. you know, how does that become Materialize, you know, in, yeah. how do, how does that become part of a material reality? How does that help us transform the material realities? Because at the end, we can have wonderful theories, and they sound beautiful, and they sound very, you know, erudite and whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but if they, if there is no way to connect them in relationship to people's everyday lives, then you, then then we we reproduce that kind of intelligentsia that has always been really problematic because they have been, whether they're on the left or right, it doesn't matter then because they are, they are not, in, they're not in touch with the reality of people's lives. Not they're connected spending so with, much time uh, yeah. Yeah. analyzing. They're spending so much time analyzing, you know, <laughs> they're happy to be in analysis. And of course, you know, part of that is protection. If I stay in my head, yeah, you, you know, there's a way that, that I can just defend my position. I never am confronted by the everyday reality of people's yeah. lives. And so, so you say that the female approach would, would uh, put the things more in balance. And, 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 uh, I think there's ways in which, you know, the, 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 issue, the issues that women have been trying to raise politically, um, have been trying to touch on those deeper questions of our beingness. And I think that's where Paulo was very good. You know, I, th I think, you know, he, he had an understanding, when, you know, of oppression as in these conditions 
that impact and in many ways obstruct our capacity to be in the world, to, mm -hmm. to evolve, to bring our, our creativity, our curiosity, our imagination, and, and be able to participate in um, creating the world. You know, so so I, 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 I've always felt that when I, you know, when I read, um, when I engage this question, that women tend to be asking the questions that are much more, that might take us more to that dialectical understanding of, of the theory practice. Yeah. Not just in the writing of theory practice, uh -huh. you know, the thinking of theory practice, but the actual doing of, of theory and practice. Um, and I, I think that one of the, the problems that we're dealing with is that the, ac the university, the academic context con is structured. I mean, it is, it is a culture of conquest it, and it is structured competitively. It is, you know, there is this notion that the, the way you gain no notoriety is by coining a phrase, coining a theory, coining. So everyone yeah. wants to, you know, I, I, you know, this is the, oh, that phrase is this. Oh, that's my, my, you know, and um, and making something new, making something new. I, I, I don't, I don't think that works in the interest of deepening our political understanding. To be so concerned about, you know, coming up with a new word, a new phrase, a new theory. I think. What is much more useful for us is creating the space for students to think more deeply about things that have been said, you know, work that has been done, mm -hmm. history that has been lived in a more deep way. How do we bring that to our everyday life okay. in the interest of transforming our world? And that's really the, the meaning of praxis. Huh? Uh, the meaning of praxis it. as a living like, praxis. It's, a it's living. so so interesting how you describe it because he, he was uh, Paulo Feia was was really a fan of of uh, the nar narrative, no, of the words, of the language, of the vocabulary, but He's not without thinking. putting it in in into daily life. And that's and right. Yeah. It's, uh, Amazing. Absolutely. I have another question. I, I'm really interested to know your, your opinion because um, you have been writing a, 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 a series of books on, on his philosophy or so, no? and we all know the, the pedagogy of uh, the oppressed. But then in his 20, 30 years of uh, publishing, he, he was also, there was a sort of evolution in, in the ideas of uh, Paul Ophéa. And that's why you, you wrote this book on, on uh, reinventing uh, uh, Paulo Freire, Pedagogy of, of Love. There is this uh, pedagogy of hope also, and then the pedagogy of, of love. Could you explain a little bit what happened in this, briefly, <laughs> if that is possible, in this, in this evolution? Um, yeah. uh, because he was saying he was um, not changing his ideas, but maybe the way he was expressing the ideas or something like that. Yeah, I think, I think that, that Paolo, like so many of us, in, in his, you know, when he begins to become radicalized, which really actually happens in Chile. I mean, he, he had already started the, the work in, the, in terms of literacy before Chile, right? Because that's part of how he becomes exiled. But his, he talked about his radicalization really happening in Chile because of Marxist scholars and, you know, who really helped him in, in evolve in his political, a deeper political understanding uh, of the socialist project and, and all of that because of what, what was happening in Chile at the time, of course. Um, so I, I, I think that, that there was an evolution in him in the same way it is with most of us, you know, yeah. when we're younger, we tend to be more, you know, our tendency is to be more dogmatic. And there's something happens as we get older. Part of it is that we have to, we start dealing with life in a more, we, we, we have more experience with life. We start to realize that um, 
staying in a kind of very close sectarian position um, is not valuable to us. You know, that what, what it does is it creates a small vanguard in a sense, but then that it's more about sustaining that vanguard or sustaining, you know, mm-hmm. people sustaining their, 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 their sense of, uh, of, you know, superiority, which often is, is part of, you know, there's, again, they create a kind of privilege around their vanguard. Um, I think that, that as he, you know, when he was exiled, he went through a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, that exile was a, a, a significant moment for him because suddenly, you know, he has to leave, you know, his country, his familiarity, you know, and then he, you know, travels to the U.S. And, and then ends up in Geneva. And so suddenly he has to deal with all sorts of different people, all sorts of different contexts um, and, and, and contend with the you know, the, the sorrow of his exile okay. and the pain of it, and which he felt very deeply, you know. Um, and in that process of dealing with our pain, you know, and our suffering, our internal suffering, there is, there is a way in which it actually begins to free us up to engage with the suffering and pain of others. Because when we don't deal with our own, it's very difficult for us to deal directly with other people's pain. In fact, uh, other people's pain annoys us. <laughs> yeah. When we when we're trying to not not feel essentially or not feel our own suffering and pain that we've that we've um, in a sense squelched, you know, and denied. Denied. It, you know, but at the at the point that you that we engage with our own pain and suffering and we begin to understand it. Um, more deeply, it opens us up to be able to be with other people's pain and suffering, not in a way that we're trying to fix it or anything, but really be with them. And I think that what Paolo understood was how the, the oppressive structures of society had an impact on all people. You know, so we could, we could, they were as dehumanizing to those who oppressed as those who were oppressed. And I think that that, that that in itself is a real opening, you know, a kind of real opening of oneself. It is interesting to me that that is, that concept is often one of the concepts that is very disruptive (laughs) to many people. You know, they, 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 you know, you know, the, the oppressed, you, you, there, there, there is no desire to have any compassion <laughs> for the, the so-called oppressor, the oppressors, right? And yet what Paolo understood is that the structures in which we live, the, the oppressive structures in which we existed, although they might have material benefit to certain people, the structures demanded uh, a a kind of inhumane <laughs> existence, a, a, a turning a blind eye to so much suffering and pain that was caused by by the inequalities and the injustices. That in essence, those people were as dehumanized as the dehumanization that they carried out in others, and that. For many people, it was you know kind of like I don't I don't want to go there I don't want to go there, mm-hmm. um, but I think that that Paolo understood that you know <laughs> two wrongs don't make a right <laughs> you know <laughs> that that we had to I, I think of all the people that I have met you know working in 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 the field and working in different areas. Paolo was an extraordinary person. And it's hard to speak about his extraordinary dimensions because people are very, you know, very quick to want to say, oh, you know, you're idolizing him or whatever. Um, I think I'm a pretty, I have a deep capacity to be objective about how I experience people and how I see people engage, Um, you know, um, I I love Paolo for who he was, and what I loved about him was his capacity 
to respect the life of the person, you know, the, the, mm-hmm. the, this, this living being that was in front of him, whoever they were, you know. Um, and so he could be at a restaurant and how he dealt with the, you know, the waiter, you know, or waitress uh, at a store, how he dealt with the person. You know, I, I had the, the opportunity to see him in different contexts. And, and what was always interesting to me was the humanity that he expressed just in his being. I think it's something that so many of us are, are striving to in our own life to be coherent with our politics, to be coherent with our vision of life, you know. And he, it's, it's not that he was perfect. It was just that even when he fell, you know, he was willing to, you know, a mistake, he was willing to, to think about it, to, to, to be, you know, he was willing to be corrected to, to, he was willing to be touched. And this is the way I think of touched by other people's views so that he wasn't closed minded. An openness. Yeah. There was an openness. Yeah. He was very authentic. That's yes. Dirk, that, that's, what I'm, I think I'm, I'm moving towards is that there was a deep authenticity that came from that coherence, mm-hmm. you know, that integrity with which he lived his life. And it's powerful. I mean, it has had, a, you know, it's a powerful effect on people. Mm-hmm. You don't have to try to do anything, but it, it is a powerful experience to be in the presence, you know, of people who, despite it all, you know, continue to live each day conscious with a certain consciousness of their commitment to integrity and coherence in who they are and in their politics. And is that the reason why uh, he um, uh, uh, chose the, the, the radical hope? I mean, as, as, I, yeah, as, as a way I, of... Is always looking for a way to, yeah. uh, you know, to um, to speak a bit. I mean, it's like when when he would speak. You probably remember this, but you know, um, you know what he would say about being patiently impatient. I mean, that's uh-huh. one thing that he would say to me, Antonio. You have to learn to be patiently impatient. I know you're yeah. impatient. I know you want the change to come now. You know? <laughs> so impatient, you know, and and I mean, he would have all these different, uh, you know. Uh, uh, ways in which he described it, but I think I think that um, he was always looking for you know, for a way to to frame it, you know, his yeah. language, to try to capture this. What what in many ways, you know, what we what we never confront is that language is limited. Yeah, <laughs> you know, there there is no way that our language can possibly capture the human spirit that can, you know, I mean, when we try to talk about love, you know, the feeling of love or, yeah. you know, inspiration or, or all, you know, I mean, suffering, you know, the, the, the anguish, the words always somehow dilute the power of what we're feeling and exactly. experiencing. And I think he was very aware of that. However, he was also very aware that language was important for that reason, yeah. you know, that to, so there was a, a great deal of thoughtfulness about how he used language and how he constructed it. In By the way, Antonio, were you talking, uh, were you speaking English with him or Spanish or um, Portuguese? Uh, English, Spanish, Portuguese. Combining <laughs> everything. It, it depended what, where, the, where the group was in. Right, yeah. the group was in. Uh, so that he was very capable, in, in, okay. you know, to express himself, um, because he also understood that we think that the only thing we're when we're speaking, that the only thing that we're engaging is the words. He understood that there's a sensibility that that when we open ourselves, when we're present 
and authentic. There is a sensibility that we are engaging with in the conversation. So it's not the words are, you know, kind of are part of it, but there's it's more than just the words. Uh-huh. It's the living experience of the moment that we are in that is being felt. And this is where I come to the, the, the issue of the body, that it's how our, the sensations in our body, how, you know, the sound, the sound of our voices. I mean, you, I don't know if you've been, you, you've probably been in situations, you know, where you're listening to somebody and they're saying the right words, but there isn't any life behind those uh-huh. words. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They're, yeah. They don't really believe it. It's, it's almost like they're just parodying. They're, 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 they're mimicking. Yeah. And how do you know that? You got the words. The words sound right. Technically, but, they're, they're, the, the words are there, but right. there's but the, lacking the sensi- something. The sensibility, the sensibility that would be in relationship to those words it seems to be missing. Mm-hmm. You know, and I just, I think, um, you know, he understood that. <laughs> So there was always this this um, this real challenge of trying to you know come to words. In there, is, there is this nice uh, quote of uh, reading the words is grasping the soul of the words. That's, no, that's it's, ah, yes. It's really, I mean, it's a quote, but like you are yeah. explaining now, that's it's like it. This, that's, no? that's exactly what what I'm talking about. It's, yeah. it's the sense that it's not just our our you know. Cere- it's a, a cerebral yeah. activity, cognitive activity that the process of communication is far more than just a cognitive experience, which is a very interesting thing because that also epistemologically is not quite European. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, the, the European epistemology tends to really uh, privilege intellect, yeah. you know, a kind of, of, of cognitive, you know, the cognitive. That, that, and, and there is great fear about how passion and emotion and sensation can corrupt truth. You know, I mean, this, this is exactly yeah. very, very typical. 